stop it. Give me two seconds to make sure we go live. We are streaming. We are streaming live on Facebook. Here we go. Twenty seconds. Okay, we are ready. Good evening and welcome everyone to the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship webinar at the American University of Beirut. Today's webinar is in collaboration with the Mediterranean Institute of the Gender Studies in Cyprus. It is titled Global Voices Discussing Feminist Blogging as Political Practice. My name is Eli Haddad. And we are coming to you live from Beirut and the beautiful island of Cyprus. Today is the 30th of November, 2021. Before Ms. Lina Abu Habib, our director, introduces our distinguished moderator and panel, I would like to ask of you to please keep your microphones on mute during the event. A small request, please. We encourage you to write your questions in the Q&A box ahead of time, as we might not be able to take them all due to the limited time we have. Most everyone will get a chance to have their questions answered after our panelist discussion. In addition, we at the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship are always available to reply to your inquiries at the email provided at, on top of the chat box, which will appear in a couple of seconds. Just to let you know, instant interpretation is available when you click on the language preferred under the interpretation tab. In addition, we will be also broadcasting live on our own Asfari Institute Facebook page. So many thanks for all of you to, for attending. And please, Lina. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. And uh, welcome to this conversation. Uh, this is the first um, collaboration with the Middle East Gender Middle East Institute for Gender Studies. I always mix them up. I'm sorry, Christina, and particularly with Christina. And um, you know, the idea for this conversation came actually when Christina and I were talking about her research. And when we talked about her research, she mentioned how connected she was while she was doing her research with another very dear and old friend of mine, Paula. Uh, and then the connection also came with um, a, a friend from another place, uh, Farah Daibis. So let me introduce you to these three amazing women. Paula is uh, our moderator. She is, um, she is on the board of Urgent Action Fund, uh, a feminist fund that supports women in urgent situations, I would say, in situations that require immediate action. Um, and also Paula is an amazing global advocate for SRHR, for sexual and reproductive health and rights. And she is joining us from Geneva, where she works with the Center for Reproductive Rights. Paula, thank you for being with us and for moderating this. Our two guests are Christina Kiley from Cyprus, from Nicosia. Uh, Christina has gone into this adventure when doing her PhD research, and she basically decided to research feminist bloggers in the MENA region. Um, it's really, um, on the one hand, unfortunate, and on the second hand, on the other, it's, it's rather bizarre that we don't often link with feminists from a nearby country from Cyprus. And I guess you guys are technically uh, MENA as well. Nevertheless, we're going to break that trend, Christina, and this is the beginning of a long-term collaboration between the Asfari Institute at AUB and Christina and the team at MIGS Middle East Institute for Gender Studies. And our second uh, um, 
panelist is Farah Daibis. Farah is from Jordan, uh, but she lives in Lebanon right now because who would want to be in Amman when they can be in Beirut, especially now? <coughs> uh, Farah manages a rather unusual program in the Middle East, which I hope she will talk to us about, uh, about political feminism. And she's also um, kind of a feminist blogger in the closet. Uh, and that's why we really wanted her here with us to have this conversation. I will leave the, um, the space entirely to Paula to moderate. And I think she has a full menu uh, for her guests. And um, Paula, over to you. And we will finish before midnight, I think, no? Hoping we will finish before midnight. Um, first of all, thank you so, so much, Lina, for this lovely um, introduction. I was not expecting uh, to be introduced as the moderator um, because I just wanted to, to leave a bit more space to our wonderful panelists. So. Thanks very much, Nina, and thank you. Um, and I also thank the University of Nicosia and the Asfari Institute for organizing this conversation. I'm trying not to call it a panel because we're envisioning this more as a conversation. Um, right from the start, I would like to emphasize something that Lina has mentioned already, is that, um, sorry, the Mediterranean Institute of Gender Studies. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Christina. I, I don't know why Lina and I have so much trouble with this. Um, it's because it's because they're one of us. So that's why. Exactly. It's university. just like, yeah, us, you know. It's absolutely yeah. fine. We are also based at the University of Nicosia. We are affiliated okay. to the University of Nicosia as Mediterranean Institute of Gender Studies. So it's, it's fine. Um, Perfectly OK. Right off the bat, I would like to say that this is indeed um, a very joyous occasion uh, for me because Christina and I, very selfishly, because Christina and I met, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago when you were starting your research and um, she was getting in touch with feminist bloggers from the regions and she did me the honor of um, interviewing me for her, for her research and engaging with my writings. And it was extremely emotional, um, Christina, to, to see the research being published and to see you being the doctor. So we keep calling you Christina. I feel that we should be calling you Dr. Kylie because you suffered enough to get that PhD. And it is my great pleasure uh, to be moderating tonight. So as has been mentioned, the topic at hand is feminist blogging as political practice. And within the conversation, we'll be focusing on, um, on different aspects of this very broad subject. And the first one I think is to try and really recontextualize feminist blogging within its temporality. As in, when you started your research, Christina, it was in 2011, something like that, if I'm not mistaken. And now it's 10 years later, and how have feminists been using these technologies and how have they been, have, we have been using uh, blogging as a, as a tool for political action. But of course, the world has changed tremendously in the past 10 years. And so our ways of engaging with these technologies have also changed tremendously. So it, there's an aspect of temporality to it. And I think linked to it is also examining how feminist blogging has really played a part in terms of um, keeping memories alive and, and playing the role of historical archives of feminist movements, recording strategies and political actions, yes, but also recording voices of feminists, some of, the, some of them who are no longer with us. Um, I'm specifically thinking of Lina Benhenni, for instance, who we lost, who you also into, introduced. Um, and so it's how, the, how feminist blogging has helped us secure um, the perennity, if I can put it this way, of, of, of these voices. Um, and the two other elements that we will, we will discuss, actually there's three, is how the use of, of uh, blogging, uh, of feminist blogging has given rise to increased rates of violence against women, which not only just applied in the streets or you know, in the physical world, but have also translated online um, with the dire impacts on the rights of women and girls and on, on bloggers that we know. Um, and the impact of that feminist blogging has had on, on transnational solidarity and something that Farah will, will get into uh, a, a little more, um, the impact of feminist blogging 
and the use that we can make uh, uh, of this uh, practical tool to repoliticize our feminist movements. Um, and so these are kind of the broad uh, questions that we will be asking and we'll be discussing tonight. Um, and Lina has already introduced you, so I'm not going to repeat what she has already done. But starting with you, Christina, um, my first question to you would be, as we have mentioned, you started this work back in the early 2010s during the first wave of revolutionary processes in the MENA region. And something that you and I have spoken about quite a bit is that we don't see revolutions have, ha, as being ended, like they come in waves and they're part of cycles and sometimes they're very long cycles. And for us, we're, we're still very much uh, in these cycles. And, as, and, and starting from this point, could you please introduce your research um, and tell us if you have seen an evolution and if, and if so, what type of evolution in how feminist activists have been using blogging as a political tool and practice, especially in restrictive contexts uh, like so many countries of the region? Thank you very much, Alina, for the invitation and the great introduction, but also you, uh, Paola, for, for this uh, uh, introduction to today's discussion. Um, indeed, I, I was listening to you now and I was reflecting back in 2012 when I met you in, in Jordan. We were there for representing our organizations uh, at the Euromed Rights Network. And it was really the, 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 the first uh, discussions that we had uh, for the um, Arab uprisings of the 2011, and we we had lengthy discussions about um, how, how the public sphere was actually a shrinking space for political voices, but at the same time, the the women in our group from from different countries, Egypt, um, even Libya later on when we met in Cairo, and um, um, and the different countries, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, how they were actually emphasizing the importance of going through this sociopolitical crisis and, and processes and how important was that women were visible, not only visible, but also uh, have substantial decision-making and political participation uh, contribution that they already had actually as, a, as, as movements. So um, this was really the, the, the start of, of, um, of me developing the research question for my research. And then when I, uh, when I came back in, in Cyprus, my, my supervisor, uh, Dr. Galliopia Gabiu Josephidis from the University of Cyprus, involved me in a, in a study for the European Parliament to, 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 to see, to, um, to analyze violence against women protesters during, um, uh, well, the title of the research uh, was uh, Women in Democratic Transitions, because in reality, we, we wouldn't know 10 years later what this wave of revolutions would, would bring. But we really knew that the women took, took the streets and uh, people protested. Uh, firstly in Tunisia, and then I think that the, the importance of that period, I mean, when, when this research started was that how fast uh, we could all see in the news um, women protesting and, and protesters generally, people, the power of the masses in, you know, claiming their rights and uh, participation and um, civil and political rights. So um, grounding my analysis in the context of contemporary feminist social theory, I, I described that moment as part of the emergence of the fourth wave fem feminism. Of course, in feminist literature, there are also critiques whether we should be framing feminism in waves, but rather in this circles and um, and contributions that are more uh, based in our sociopolitical positioning. So um, I used feminist standpoint theory exactly to, 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 to because they also uh, provide a critique, not only uh, for how 
um, Western-based uh, definitions of the public sphere and political participation excluded, and, and that public sphere must be an inclusive space, but at the same time, the, the feminist literature actually says that our own social positioning, and I mean historical, social, class, um, uh, can also produce feminist knowledge. And therefore, by choosing uh, the case studies in this research, um, uh, 10 blogs, uh, one, um, your blog was one of them, but also from, Liba from um, Lebanon, Abrika Das, and uh, from Egypt, um, Lina Benmeni from Tunisia, who was one of the first who actually in Tunisia went in remote villages and uh, cities to report actually the violations of human rights. So to cut the long story short, the research question was, what is the role of feminist blogging in transcending spaces? Because we also knew that I think that the most important um, element was that we entered a new chapter in, in, in the recent history of the MENA region, but also globally, signifying political participation in the digital age. And reflecting now 10 years later, we see how this transnational feminist solidarity also grew. But also, if we think that in 10 years, we, we are even talking about the fifth or sixth, or sixth wave feminism, that means that um, there are specific elements of these developments and, um, and, uh, and how organic movements can also develop through this. Of course, what I'm saying is that the internet opened up new opportunities for mobilization, but also we know that also social media can give platforms to um, racist views as well, and populism and uh, neo-colonial, neoliberal uh, uh, discourses. So, um, but what's important, it's the voices behind these tools. Thanks so much, Christina. I think that the, the, the premise of your research was so interesting. And I think that they, so much of, of, of your findings, I feel, are, are applicable um, to what we're facing today. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how you have found that feminist blogging has, has enabled us to keep a record kind of a, femi a global feminist archive, if you will. Um, I think that the concept of memory is extremely import important in, in all fields. And when I think about political activism, feminist activism, what you were just describing in terms of the waves, right? Like we identify waves of feminism and it seems that they're almost very, very fixed in, in there in, the, in each period. And I'm always wondering if, if we shouldn't actually go beyond um, this kind of understanding of feminist waves and understand that, you know, feminists react obviously to the world that they are forced to live in um, and devise strategies where they think that they can make gains. And so how, how can feminists today, feminists who are 20, 25, um, the age we were <laughs> 10 years ago, I don't know about you, Farah, but me and Christina. Um, how, how can they build on what we've tried to do, the way that we're trying to build on what our predecessor have tried to do, um, using that type of, of archives that we have created at the time, not really knowing, at the time really just using these platforms to make our voices heard. And then 10 years later, we realized that they do are, they are part of feminist memories um, that are an in, in interesting key part of the region. Um, I would love to hear more your thoughts about that. First of all, um, the, 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 when, when the research question started to develop, I, um, I wanted to provide um, a reconceptualization and a, and a and a dialogical understanding of what political participation means um, in the digital age, especially when we know that when challenging 
uh, when, when research power dynamics and structures, we need feminist research taught us that we need to, to be able to gain the knowledge from those that are marginalized from the public sphere. So to answer this question, I uh, and, and, and actually the findings of the research from the narrative, I've put the central role in my analysis on, on the narratives and storytelling. Um, I borrowed Iris Marion Young's um, uh, three moments of, uh, of inclusive political narrative because I was interested to see the language and the linguistic um, uh, analysis, the discourses um, uh, from the blogs. So I actually analyzed the blog posts of the uh, blogs where I could um, identify and analyze, analyze these discursive strategies. And, so, and this, these results actually could be split, split in, in three elements, voice, space, and power. So from the narratives and storytelling, we saw, I saw that um, um, from individual stories and the life circumstances, but also in providing a, a critical feminist analysis for, for subjects like um, uh, vi political violence, um, uh, virginity tests in, in Egypt, um, the, the corruption of the internet in Lebanon, um, the, the, vi the sexual violence um, towards women protesters in the streets. Um, so these discursive strategies pointed out some, um, some storytelling and narrative that was not only individual, but also collective. For example, the, the, uh, the narration and storytelling among these three elements, um, uh, narration and storytelling, the affirmative rhetoric used in, the, in this writing, but also um, political acknowledgement and listening, not only with the audience of the blog, but also among bloggers, the communication among bloggers, um, uh, the, the dissemination of um, invitations to public events and protests, but also the most important, and that was very specific in the case of uh, Lina Benmeni, the Tunisian blogger, was also poetry and also documenting the violence, also the violence she experienced. But it was not only Lina, a lot of the bloggers were writing in exile, in, um, in diaspora. So recording these types of violence, political violence, uh, sexual violence, but also providing a safe space for the stories of other activists uh, was of paramount importance. And this was recorded as one of the strategies. This was the, the, the voice element, but also with regards to the spatial element, um, there were, um, and the transcendence of, of space was also that the block itself was also local, but also cross-posting articles and um, writing about um, global advocacy platforms like Glo Global Voices, um, or other international media, and also the commentary, for example, in the third element, the power, apart from producing feminist knowledge by providing the readers with what's happening on the ground, uncensored information about what's happening um, during this, uh, uh, this volatile, but also very crucial sociopolitical processes, this created also communities. And this is the third element of what makes today's um, transnational feminists so powerful because of their uh, locality and the fast um, mobilization that can um, bring up uh, across, uh, across countries. Um, with regards to the archives, um, Feminist blogging, blogging can be conceptualized as, as archives of feminists because they document events, but also creating memory, like you said. So the production of this knowledge, it's a longstanding practice of feminist activists, but in and, and documenting history is perceived also as power, as, as it's perceived as and writing memory that can potentially destabilize power as well. And even though this aspect 
came came in the findings of this research at a later stage, and I think it's a very important element that future research should address, is that it captures this historical moment, but like you said, protests and revolutions are, are, are alive and constantly developing. We have seen this also in 2019 in Lebanon. We have seen the, the, activ uh, the activists in, in Sudan, uh, in so many countries. So reflecting now after so many waves of, of revolutions in different scales and in different times in each country, what, what, what feminist blogging brings up is actually how, how, what, what might be the societal impact of their political activists as co-creators of history? And how can we ensure the acknowledgement as well of these political acts as histories, her stories? Um, how can we, um, uh, how, how can these questions be starting points for interdisciplinarity in the future of, of feminist uh, writing of archiving history, feminist history in the 21st century. And um, I joined the calls of, of many activists, but also scholars in the field, especially for the, from the Global South. And to be honest, the reason I felt close to, to my colleagues and but also to the bloggers in this study is because I could see similar uh, problems from my own position in here in, as, a, as a Greek Cypriot, um, as a Greek Cypriot, daughter of uh, uh, Greek Cypriot refugees, but also being part of the feminist and the peace movement that we have been struggling for years to include women's voices in the peace negotiations. And not to mention our post-colonial and post-conflict um, realities. It doesn't mean that because Cyprus is part of the European Union, that we don't, we, we don't, um, uh, I, I can totally relate to, to the problems that are faced in, uh, uh, by women in the, in the MENA region. I think I really love what you said about us being co-creators of history. Um, I feel that one of the reasons that we, a lot of us took up blogging at the time and still now, and I'm, I'm really looking forward also to Farah's intervention in terms of, of being a closeted feminist blogger. Now, is, is the, I think the frustration, as you were mentioning, that our voices were not being heard and that no one was really interested um, in what we had to say in kind of traditional media. And this is why we turned to these platforms because it was it was out of frustration it was out of anger but it was also out out of a desire to build alternative narr uh, narratives to what we were seeing and to kind of build a parallel um discourse around what we think society should look like once we dismantle um heteronormative patriarchy and other systems of oppression and discrimination and I think that while doing so, a lot of us faced enormous backlash. Um, I think that it was also like taking to, to these platforms was also um, a, a result of all the violence that we were facing in the streets and that we were facing during demonstrations and, and that violence kept going unrecognized. And I, I think it's not just in the MENA. I think that as you were mentioning, it's it's, old feminists that dare to occupy public space and that dare to take the streets are going to be insulted, are going to be, um, you know, like insults are gonna be hurled at us um, wherever we are in the world. It's not specific to any, to any region. And we also felt that this needed to be highlighted, the degree of violence that we were facing. And I think that I would like to, I would like us to, like also to stop and consider that violence and the impact that it can have on, on women behind the screens because being insulted in the street is something, it's like a face-to-face -face inter interaction, but you know, people feel much more comfortable in the safety of behind their screens and the level of harassment and violence and violations that women who occupy the digital space have to face um, so I would like I would like you if you if you can please elaborate on that and also give us pointers as to what strategies have feminist bloggers developed to kind of counter um, 
this violence. It's 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 um, what you're saying. It's it's very important, and um, there are a lot of discussions on the hatred uh, received by women human rights defenders generally today until today. Um, but with regards to the time frame of the specific research, what I have seen is that um, uh, from the narratives and the discursive strategies employed from the ten uh, uh, bloggers in this study. Um, was that, well, it depends. For example, I remember from Lina Bermeni in Tunisia, she actually took pictures of, of the violence she received and she actually posted them. At the same time, when her blog was censored, she was, um, she, she was taking screenshots and with, and, and with, this, with the titles um, censored but still writing, or um, my, my Facebook was censored, and so you can see how actually, despite the violence and the, um, and the hatred received, she kept going. Um, at the same time though, I mean, in the case of, um, of the Syrian uh, uh, Marcel, Shehar, for example, when she was detained, she actually gave her passwords to, to other bloggers um, to, to, to inform the audience uh, and, and um, and especially international audience, but I'm sure the, the Arabic speaking audience as well, that she was where she was. And for me, that was the highest act of solidarity among the blogging community. And that's also what shows how um, we can speak of, of, of the blogosphere in, in certain con contexts as a community by themselves, but also their audiences as communities. Um, and um, how this can also act as record making and evidence um, mapping. Um, I know this does not always result in justice, but uh, in the case of online hatred, for example, um, we, we have seen, sorry, I just remembered also, we have seen this also in the case of Nazra for feminist studies and how travel bans and uh, freeze of assets has, have been also tools for censoring uh, women activists, especially th those who write and analyze and provide a critical analysis of the protest, but also of politics and how they say, how, and, and how women have been instrumentalized um, and used also for, this, for the purposes of state feminism. Um, uh, and, and if you allow me to say in our countries, um, not only in these countries. So um, that's, that's where the power element of this alternative knowledge that the blogs provide us with, because someone would say, and, and, and it's recorded that, for example, Twitter is a mini blogging. It's, it's a micro blogging um, platform. But again, the, the blogs are archives as well. Um, and um, well, the, the, the answer to your question on how to combat online violence, I think it comes as a, as a global issue as well. But um, fr from these findings, exposing the attacks on the freedom of speech has been also um, a tool, a discursive tool as well as the resistance to the, to the political elites, to the, um, to the oppressive systems. So um, challenging corrupt systems and structures, it's on its own revolutionary, if, if I may say so. <laughs> Thank you very, very well may say so. Um, from what I remember as well, I think that was, I, I really like what you were saying around building communities of solidarity. Um, from what I remember as well, there was this element of organized. So you also highlighted kind of the resistance component to that violence that feminist bloggers were and are facing. And from that, that um, reality stemmed a lot of, of organizing around this specific issue. And, and you mentioned Abir Hattas uh, at the beginning of your, of your intervention and uh, Abir and other feminist bloggers were um, at the forefront of, of, of co-creating strategies of resistance and of organizing on the issue of digital security, 
on the issue of kind of recognizing hatred online and violence online and how to respond to it. And that also contributed to change laws and that also contributed to develop norms and standards at the global level. I mean, you have human rights council resolutions that speak directly to women in, in, in the digital sphere. So they're like to the point where feminist organizing has led to the creation of standards um, because of the situations that they, they found themselves in. Um, and I think the core driver um, behind those changes is solidarity. And I think my last question to you um, is around transnational solidarity and how feminist blogging can help build this transnational solidarity that is at the root, I think, of all of our major gains um, and that we're seeing like a, a new momentum for, I feel, with different movements in Latin America, in MENA, um, and in other regions of the world where there is this impetus to build bridges, especially within the, glo within the global South countries. Yes, and this is, this is exactly why it was not just a historical period. Um, the, the, the start of the Arab uprisings. It, it, I think it signified exactly the new chapter in, this, in, in, in the feminist movements, uh, but also in, in, in virtual sisterhood and, and transnational feminist solidarity, because exactly, uh, I will just give you some examples of statements um, from, the, um, uh, from the audience of these blogs. For example, they said, um, um, for example, the, the blogger from Yemen, um, she said, um, I want to be like her when she met in a, in a bloggers forum with uh, Lina Benmeni from Tunisia, but also um, uh, from the audience, they said, St I stand with women revolutionary power. Did you say an isolated case? Um, you're certainly not alone. Um, they, they were even giving advice in the comment section that you are the government, that you have the power of the people, um, uh, treat yourselves like you are the government after a coup, so you need to retake, um, uh, you need to retake stability and um, make the power of uh, the, the voices of the marginalized um, as your central point for strategizing. So all this has shaped our new identities as feminists as well. And um, uh, it actually reconstructs feminism as over overlapping feminist spaces. And uh, I think um, well, in my analysis, I bring together this micro and macro level because that's what the blocks actually do together in their diverse strategies, not only by um, bringing together the calls of different activists in their writing and in their poems and in their advocacy, but also, for example, they, they've written, Nazra for Feminist Studies have written also um, joint statements with other advocacy groups. Uh, they, they have been promoting also their analysis on the violence and the sexual violence of uh, towards human rights defenders, women human rights defenders. But also what they show us is that the margin becomes a place of alternative power. And because of these tools and the voices behind them, um, this marginality becomes also a source of knowledge and, and power because of the community aspect. And, um, and that's why it cannot be um, positioned in geographical um, uh, spaces. It can be also local, but also global. And it can connect the inner with the outer. And also um, uh, this locality is a, is a very dynamic process. And for me, this is what redefines political participation when we look at feminist blogging the dialogical understanding of what political participation means. And this, this comes together, of course, with networks and this constant interaction and networking happening online, but also offline. 
I remember your blog post, um, uh, Paola, for example, when we, you were um, blogging during the, um, the AWIT, it was the AWIT uh, conference. And your words were actually very powerful because you said how all this is redefining um, the future of feminist organizing. And I think that was great. And I think it's great that we can reflect to it now, 10 years later, even if the dreams um, were not maybe realized, but they have pushed the movements um, and cross movement collaborations as well in a different stage, I think. It, it's an open discussion, actually. It's an open dialogue. I think it's a, the, the AWIT Forum of 2012 in Istanbul, I think is a very good segue um, to move us into the conversation with Farah. Um, because it was, you know, whenever feminists gather, new ideas emerge. And this particular convening was, in, was extremely interesting to me because it was a mix of you know sex workers and trade unionists and like all, all of us under the banner of feminism um and the the questions that we will explore with you farah is around the repoliticization of feminist movements and i think that what we have seen now uh, and and increasingly seeing is the impact of neoliberal policies and the impact of donor dynamics um, on, on feminist movements and on how the ever increased, um, sorry, <laughs> being a feminist also means like having childcare duties sometimes. Um, and I think that what we are seeing more and more is um, how actually these dynamics really are looking to depoliticize feminist movements and to and you know, the, for, the, the force of capital, the strength of capitalism really is to instrumentalize uh, social justice movements, including feminist movements for its own gains. And so what we're seeing now is like a light version of feminism that is being co-opted by brands. Uh, and, and, you know, this is, this is something that, you know, women see um, every October month with Pink October, but that's just like one example amongst many. And it's how do we, how do we redefine feminism as a subversive political movement um, that looks at destroying systems of oppression like capitalism and not coexisting with it. So what I would like to hear from you, Farah, is in your view, what are the main drivers of the depoliticization of feminist movements? Thank you, Paula, and, and uh, thank you for the uh, organizers for, for allowing me to be part of this really interesting conversation. Uh, and congratulations to Dr. Kylie on, on your dissertation. Uh, I really found your, your conclusions uh, very insightful and, and thought-provoking. Um, maybe to begin, uh, uh, I could um, clarify what we mean by depoliticizing. So uh, basically to depoliticize something uh, means to, for lack of a better word, strip off uh, uh, its political tone or, or character or even uh, remove something from political activity or influence. Um, of course, we know that feminism is uh, inherently uh, uh, political. It, it aims to uh, uh, challenge and change the status quo, specifically in light of the discrimination and violence that women and girls uh, face under uh, patriarchy and, and all its accomplices. Um, it demands the, the redistribution of, of power and uh, resources, and it um, has a vision, as you said, Paula, to, uh, um, for how society should be organized and identifies how we can achieve that vision, uh, like any other political uh, stream or theory. Um, so uh, a depoliticized feminist movement um, is basically one that conforms or normalizes, uh, or at least stays within the confines of the status quo. Um, it, it uses discourses, demands, or, or forms of activism uh, in a way that does not um, challenge power and 
uh, or demand the redistribution of, of power and resources uh, with the intensity and, and the urgency uh, uh, that it should. Um, it is also one that um, does not clearly offer an alternative uh, uh, holistic and practical vision uh, of how society should be organized to achieve justice. Um, I think that uh, the main reasons that the, uh, led to the depoliticization of, of uh, uh, feminist movements uh, um, specific in globally and specifically uh, in the global south are, as you uh, uh, both of you mentioned, um, um, oppressive system, systems co-opting our, our movements. Um, this includes uh, capitalism, mainly <laughs> includes capitalism and neoliberalism, um, which use and distort uh, uh, um, feminism to uh, their benefit, to the benefit of the system. Um, changing uh, its demands from revolving around, you know, social, so, social solidarity to supporting uh, um, and benefiting the market in, in uh, various different ways. This includes not only how, how you know, uh, capitalism uses feminism to uh, uh, influence women and women's, uh, uh, you know, consumerist behaviors. It also includes... Uh, um, uh, changing the demands of the feminist movement or women's rights movements themselves. Uh, in the region, this, uh, for example, this includes um, focusing too narrowly on, on increasing the rate of women's uh, participation in the for, uh, formal uh, labor force, uh, which many of us know that um, without the, the like, reorganization of, of uh, care work, without the provide provision of decent working conditions is not a feminist solution. Um, other examples is, you know, a bit going overboard or even glorifying uh, uh, women entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, uh, um, uh, as well as, for example, um, advocating for programs like uh, uh, micro uh, loans um, as a as uh, presumably uh, uh, as a tool to um, empower poor women, putting all the all the risk on their shoulders, of course, rather than uh, on the shoulders of the of the system. Um, you also, both of you mentioned state feminism. Of course, uh, um, state feminism also co-opted uh, uh, our movements. Um, there, this is a very prominent uh, uh, issue in the region uh, where basically women's liberation um, was taken over by authoritarian uh, regimes, uh, limiting the potential of fundamental change uh, uh, that challenges the political status quo. Um, of course, also the very nature of, of uh, state feminism is anti-feminist because it, it uh, simply perpetuates the the a perception that women uh, are passive victims that are waiting for the patriarch to save them. Um, state feminism also uses uh, uh, women's rights to, to you know, polish uh, uh, the state's image. Saudi is, uh, Arabia is an excellent example of that. Um, another another uh, major factor is also, as you mentioned, uh, Paula, is the um, uh, increasingly uh, NGOized nature of uh, uh, our trend in feminist activism. Um, I think this this resulted in in focusing uh, uh, in the movement focusing more and more on project based work instead of uh, broad based criticism and action uh, uh, against the patriarchy. Uh, of course, many feminist organizations uh, uh, in the region had no choice but to conform to, to this new uh, uh, professionalized uh, um, feminist landscape. Um, but uh, this also began uh, threatening the integrity of, uh, and agency of the movement. Um, uh, this minimized uh, mobilization potential. It also created a gap uh, between feminist uh, research or, or theory and feminist activism. Uh, it alienated feminists working outside the, you know, formal feminist movement. Uh, and it um, alienated also young feminists or even young women who did not necessarily relate to these single issue 
uh, narratives used by by feminist organizations. Um, I'll stop here and give the floor back to you, Paula. I'm going to very quickly give it back to you, um, because what I would like us to explore is really how do we repoliticize feminist movements. I think you have really touched upon a very important point, which is how a lot of organizations could not afford not to, to play by donor dynamics and, and feed into these neoliberal policies um, just to be able to survive. But that actually has created increased competitions between organizations rather than strengthening, strengthening the social uh, movement's fabric. And so how do we, what are the tools that we have? Feminist blogging might be one of them that would enable us to actually repoliticize and kind of take back our own narrative and our own agenda to force donors um, in a way to reflect our demands and not having them impose their priorities onto us. And I'll try to focus a bit first on, on more yeah, on the movement itself and what can uh, what can it do to to repoliticize itself beyond uh, uh, donor relations, let's say. Um, uh, first, uh, it's uh, absolutely vital that uh, demands of the movements uh, re become realigned with with core feminist principles. Uh, we need to produce content that fills in the uh, gaps between feminist activism and uh, feminist theory. Um, this also includes, you know, opening a, um, a conversation about the type of narratives and demands uh, that conform to any kind of, of oppressive system. Um, uh, it's also one of the strategies is to pursue, is to not pursue a single strategy. Uh, um, this means that we need a collective uh, effort to, to understand questions of intersectionality, uh, which should also translate into accepting the, the diversity of, of actors uh, and their approaches and, and interests. Um, and very important uh, uh, strategy is to uh, formulate feminist alternatives that aim to or dare to uh, create a vision of, of justice uh, that can be described as a, you know, a practical utopia. Uh, that also means that we cannot normalize any form of uh, 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 oppression. Um, it's uh, important, uh, I think you touched based on, on this uh, uh, point, uh, to link feminism with other social justice movements, uh, especially within the, the, you know, the crisis of capitalism that we are experiencing today, um, which reinforces every kind of, of a form of oppression uh, um, from racism to every form of oppression. Uh, and it has also resulted in the, in the degradation of the environment and the class, uh, climate catastrophe that, that we are facing. Um, and finally, uh, to create a, a broad base, uh, based social movement that uh, first and foremost is, is for women uh, and all of, all of all women. This means that um, we need to drift away from the NGOized uh, uh, trend um, to win over young women who might feel marginalized by, by you know, dominant actors in the movement. And I really think that blogging is, is a tool that can be used to accomplish all of that and, and more. I mean, the process of, of feminist blogging utilizes very well um, multiple feminist uh, uh, strategies. Um, from, you know, using uh, uh, empathy and self-reflection. Uh, this includes, you know, self-awareness and interrogation, uh, thoughtful self-reflective uh, um, uh, leadership, um, especially in the process of, of writing. Um, blogging is an act of self-care uh, as it gives a platform for, to express, feel heard and, and vent. Uh, um, it's, it's also an act of rebellion, as you uh, mentioned, uh, simply because it, it defies authority, uh, um, especially through claiming spaces that uh, have been closed off by patriarchy. And here, you know, it, it goes from, I mean, public spaces in general, but then it becomes an online public space. Um, uh, uh, 
feminist blogging relinks uh, feminist theory with, with activism, uh, especially through providing an accessible form of, of content uh, to activists that is uh, grounded in, in feminist theory. It also just uh, drifts away from, from NGOization uh, uh, because everyone can, can blog. You don't have to be uh, part of anything to, to be able to do that. Um, it engages young women, both as you know, producers and consumers of, of feminist con uh, content. Um, of course, it's uh, uh, as you uh, both mentioned before, it shifts power um, through challenging the patriarchy, of course, uh, but also through uh, using participatory approaches uh, in terms of engagement, commentary, uh, and the production of, of knowledge and, and narratives. Um, it also does so through uh, utilizing and uh, claiming positive forms of transformative power. Um, this is based on uh, Just Associates framework for uh, transformative power, which uh, uh, identifies four, four, four forms of power um, that contribute to sustainable, long-lasting shifts towards gender equality. Um, the first is power within which is an individual's uh, uh, realization that uh, you have the power within yourself, power within a person's sense of uh, self-worth, uh, dignity and self-knowledge, uh, and capacity to think, imagine, and question, and, and hope. Um, the second form of power is power two, uh, which is the willingness um, um, and capacity to take action. The third form of power is power with, which is uh, uh, you know, power uh, of numbers in working um, for a common goal uh, um, and shared purpose. Um, and power for, uh, which is a form of power that enables us to identify what we stand for, uh, uh, what the desired change we have, and, and enables us to define uh, and work towards the alternative vision uh, we have of the world. Um, I hope I didn't take too long. And that at all, I think, I think it's crucial to subvert power dynamics the way that we see them, uh, which is what feminist movements are all about: is to actually subvert these dynamics. Um, and sorry, I have, I, I have another, I have another one. I, I produced another one. Um, <laughs> Um, I think I would also like, maybe because you say about yourself that you're a closeted feminist blogger and, um, you know, us feminists, we like everything out in the open. So I think my question, my next question to you will likely be more uh, personal. You were mentioning blogging as an act of self-care, of self-care, which I find really interesting because it also flies in the face of the traditional admission of what self-care is, which is under capitalist logic, just, you know, go get yourself a nice massage. And it's, it's, it's I think, definitely a subversive positioning to say that blogging is part of self-care. And I'd like to ask you, um, how, like, what is your own experience um, about blogging, what what it, what opportunities has provided you? It has provided you with, um, and how you feel building these alternative narratives. Um, first of all, Lena called me a, a closeted uh, uh, blogger. <laughs> um, yeah, I just I I uh, just feel like I haven't uh, you know gained the uh, earned the title because I just. Uh, don't do it enough and I often do it through uh, um, uh, work which I feel like I'm, I'm a bit compromised you know uh, working at an uh, uh, um, like an international uh, foundation um, um, but honestly for me I've, I've always loved to writing was my favorite way uh, uh, of expressing um, uh, and um, in the past period I started uh, you know getting more and more interested in the in, in, in writing and it just so happens that the topics that I work uh, on uh, um, are really topics that interest me a lot so um Somehow I, I found that uh, when I get an opportunity to, to write about something, when, when it pops in my head that I would like to write about something, uh, I feel like um, generally the process really 
forces me to to fill in uh, gaps in in my knowledge uh, about any any topic I I write on. You you really need to understand the problem to be able to uh, explain it. Um, in terms of the uh, formulating a narrative, uh, uh, I think honestly, today talking about the, the repoliticization of, of feminism, this is something I've written about, and I find it uh, a lot easier now to 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 talk about this in a in a clear you know frame. Let's say um, it also helps me you know uh, articulate a, a feminist random feminist thoughts that that would otherwise really remain scattered in in my head um and it pushes me to to really recognize uh, um the specific areas that uh, i'm most interested in uh, and to position me a bit in uh, 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 within the feminist spectrum i've i've started writing a, a few articles that i never finished because i found that i have it doesn't make sense. They're just thoughts that don't really link together somehow. And I've managed to, uh, on other topics, to to come up with things that uh, uh, I I personally changed my uh, uh, like a two page uh, article that changed my whole perspective on a on a topic just through working on, working on it. You know, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, and I think my last question to you will be the last question that I had for Christina, which is around building feminist solidarity. Uh, I'd love to have your take on it because it's such a crucial point. Um, I think, you know, the issues we are we are all facing today are, are global issues. The the crisis of capitalism, uh, the environmental uh, uh, catastrophe, uh, everything we we many of the problems we are facing, despite the uh, the differences in context, are very similar. Uh, and I think um, one way of of uh, uh, challenging that, or or um, yeah, I would say challenging that is is also using all the tools uh, uh, um, and strategies that I mentioned before and that Christina mentioned and you mentioned uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, repoliticizing uh, uh, our movements and, and um, um, yeah, I, I think this is one very important uh, uh, point is, uh, as I said, like, yeah, uh, using all the, all the strategies that uh, uh, I mentioned uh, before, uh, as well as, um, you know, feminist blogging itself uh, can definitely also support uh, uh, transnational uh, solidarity building. Uh, Christina mentioned Nazra and, and the uh, writing of, of uh, joint statements. Um, I think this, uh, this really like taking strong positions against forms of oppression that don't necessarily are not necessarily affecting you uh, uh, is a is a great way of displaying solidarity with with other just social justice movements. Uh, um, this includes you know um, also creating nurturing a feminist uh, uh, a transnational feminist discourse that encompasses all, all these struggles uh, and recognizes that um, there can be no, no liberation of women without addressing all forms of, of oppression that, that sustain the patriarchy uh, worldwide. Um, yeah. Yes, I think that it's a beautiful way of ending the conversation. None of us can be free until all of us are. Um, I don't know, Christina, if you would like to add anything else before we move on to the Q&A session uh, of, the, of the event. Thank you, Paola. I, I was going to add to what Farah said, is that um, indeed, I, I mean, what we have discussed um, so far is that actually that feminist constructions of political participation help us overcome mainstream approaches of, of doing politics. And especially now with, um, for example, personally, now that we are able 
I mean, after the COVID-19, I mean, it was amazing. We were discussing this in the office as well, that it's amazing that we, we had the opportunity to participate in webinars and um, vlogs and podcasts um, that we didn't have the opportunity to attend to before. And I think that's also another strategy used in our diverse uh, strategies not only in blogging, but also in networking as feminists. And I, I grouped together some characteristics of, of, of the constantly evolving feminists, feminists in the 21st century that may be helpful for the Q&A &A discussion. For example, I've noted here the mediation with internet communication, the intersectionality and inclusivity, um, democratic organized political activists in the form that also um, Farah mentioned, Farah mentioned um, engagement in local processes that forge and or, uh, that forge organize uh, cross movement synergies and uh, mobilize um, and mobilization to exercise uh, pressure. And I think this this can be could be accurate. I think to understand this dynamic engagement. As new, as new modes or waves of uh, in feminist politics as well in the 21st century. I think that can be also um, a value highlighted in, a, in as a communicative democracy um, in the evolutionary stages in, in our com contemporary uh, stage. Well, I hope it helped this uh, addition. Paula? I was going to give you the floor, Nina. Yes, actually, I want to jump in with, uh, um, if I may, with a couple of questions. And the first one is to you, Paula, because um, I remember, yes. Because <laughs> um, I remember very well uh, um, your writings, uh, which in a way preceded uh, the, the pre um, kind of first round of revolutions writings. Um, and they were um, incredibly insightful in terms of, you know, it was all, always the voices of women in their diversity. It was always about the lived experiences of, uh, of women. Um, and there was a sequence, if I remember uh, well, uh, which many of us used to kind of wait for. And, and, and you know, um, I know it's intrusive, uh, um, but but is it possible um, for us to hear more about this? You know, talking about uh, writing, talking about the lives of women um, in kind of the details of daily experiences. Uh, and, you know, the details that are not visible to the external world or even felt, um, and also the details about the, the thought processes and the, you know, the, the, the different emotions and sometimes the overlapping emotions. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, could you take us through, you know, what, 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 it, what it meant to be able to formulate this? Uh, it's like having different personas of women at the same time in the same room, on the same page, if I may say. That wasn't a clear question, I'm sorry, but... Um... Luckily, I've known you for a long time, so I understood the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not intrusive. I think, I think we all come at feminist blogging from different points of view, and, and my, my um, entry point was actually the emotions and the and and the lives of of my life and and the lives of of women around me and i guess it, it was because i felt that it had been so belittled by patriarchy um that i i felt that it, it and, and it didn't really it doesn't still it doesn't really interest um a lot of people i feel that you know we mentioned very briefly the pandemic but i think that we could have like a whole other conversation around the pandemic and you hear here and there that women have borne the brunt of reproductive labor during this pandemic, but it's nowhere near enough acknowledged clearly that if the world has been able to have some resemblance of sanity over the past two years is because women have literally 
um, uh, carried it on our shoulders and girls as well. And in, in a lot of instances, very young girls. And it's not recognized and it's not valued and it's not compensated, but on top of it, it's romanticized. So it's just like, you know, it's that, that, that very rosy picture of, you know, women make the world go round, but in the process, that world is grinding us to our death. And no, and for me, the pandemic has been like, it was over, like, it was so glaringly um, blinding in a way that it cannot be bypassed. And, and just to go back to my writing, I think it's the kind of thing that I paid a lot of attention to um, because women's lives and women's struggles have always been swept around like under the rug. And, and it, it's one thing to study it as a sociologist or as, you know, as, as, as a scholar is one thing to come at it from even from an economic perspective but I felt that there was a lot of things that were left unsaid and whole lives of women who dedicated their lives to everyone else and then went on to die without having one of their own desire being completely fulfilled. And I felt that that was, it was important for me to talk about that um, because not, I don't feel that anything has changed really. And if it weren't for the, for the trailblazing women, who decide that, you know what, life isn't going to be like that for me. And by daring to go against everything that society tells me I should be doing, and by going against every gender stereotype in the book, exposing, exposing oneself to a lot of backlash, um, nothing would ever have changed. No law, no practice, no, no, no point of view, nothing would have ever changed. So I guess like my process was that, and also because I, I you know, I, it feels comfortable to me. Um, that particular emotional world that is very much linked to, I also wanted to embody the personalist political type of, of thing. Like I didn't want to observe things from a distance that might be scholar or academic. I, you know, I'm, I'm a woman, I'm an Arab woman. I'm an Arab woman from the diaspora. I'm a cisgendered woman. I speak from a very specific location. Um, and I count myself as, you know, struggling, just like so many other of my sisters are. Um, and so it was, that it was important for me to center experiences way before lived experience became the kind of phrase that you needed to have in a donor proposal to get a grant. Um, we've been talking about our experiences for so long. Um, and we've been trying to organize around our politically and so we, this is why we have embodied the personalist political. We have organized around our experience and feminists have been doing that, mobilized and organized around our experiences for a long time. It was just that no one was paying attention. Um, and with time and with mass organization, mass mobilization, some of our priorities have gained traction. There's still so much work to do and you're not gonna do that work by continuing to belittle the experiences that, that cis and, and trans women are facing. So that was kind of background to my writing. Thank you for sharing this, Paula. Uh, I had more, but there are two questions in the three questions in the Q&A. Um, and if, um, do you want Paula to, um, go through them and maybe amongst the three of you, you could address them. Sure, so we have a, a question from Ali, um, who's asking us, sorry, like Farah mentioned, blogging is a way to fight the influence of capitalism and neoliberalism and feminism. But the problem is that blogging is also an available tool for capitalists and neoliberals. So how can we differentiate between real feminist blogs and other ones. Maybe I'll, I'll, maybe I'll share the three questions and, and then yes. we can each of us, okay. Um, and then we have another uh, question. Which approach do you think feminist blogs and literature in general should use to be able to reach more people and make them more sensitive to their struggles, especially reaching people who are not sensitive to this topic or do not identify as a woman? And the last question we have is speaking up 
about a certain issue plays a major role in the healing process. For example, if a woman speaks about sexual harassment that she once faced, that will help her understand the issue and how to heal from that trauma. What about women who attack the women who speak up about their experiences because it is a shame on the family slash tribe? What is the right way to deal with such responses? So just to sum up, we have one question around blogging is available to everyone. So how do we differentiate? Um, which approach can we, can we take to disseminate more like feminist ideas? And then what with women who attack other women whose rights have been violated? Who would like to start answering? I can, I can start with the first uh, question. I think an, uh, an important uh, uh, differentiation is you know, feminist blog, because this is one of the limited spaces that uh, where they are allowed to speak freely. Uh, capitalists and uh, uh, those who support neoliberalism have all other formal uh, forms of, of uh, um, uh, media and, and uh, other platforms. Um, I think it's also uh, awareness is a very important uh, 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 like raising awareness and and uh, 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 learning more about feminist uh, uh, approaches and strategies also helps in, in differentiating between uh, uh, the two. Um, and I think you know uh, uh, it's not it's not the problem that we have uh, we have to acknowledge of course that there are diverse uh, actors that have their own agendas this is not uh, uh, something we are able to control um but it's also uh, especially given the the covid uh, pandemic it has become uh, uh, you know the failures of capitalism have have become very clear to to so many people so i think it's um it's not a problem that that uh, uh, if they want to blog, <laughs> um, uh, uh, but it's just important for us to to ground our and reflect on what we read and and uh, uh, think about the the links between uh, feminist practices and, and feminist theories and and what we are reading. Can I also add on this? Before we move on to that, um, I was thinking of this um, uh, question when we were discussing, because I remembered when I started this research, when I started this research, um, the numbers of women blogging about social and political change were very little. And maybe, maybe uh, it would be interesting to see the numbers now today, because most of the women bloggers are, on the, are around the fashion and lifestyle blogging or, or even some traveling and motherhood blogs. So um, this fact on its own, this statistic on its own, it's interesting to see how actually the women who capitalize on blogs for these pur purposes to promote human rights, to promote gender equality, to promote civil and political rights, um, which, which are movements that often has been led by, I mean, mostly have been led by men. So um, I, I, I agree with Farah that um, uh, we, we, must, we must not forget this. Um, and it will be actually very interesting to, to, to look for the numbers today and see how, um, how women are distributed in this. But, but from, I mean, from the perspective from my perspective here in Cyprus, I see more and more women, Turkish Cypriot women um, uh, as well, but it's, it, it's indeed a landscape that we haven't explored much. And I see more women blogging, blogging, podcasting, usually those who podcast have also blogs. Um, so they, they talk more and more about peace building and, um, and um, uh, other types of solidarity as well for for, um, uh, for that that under that are also covered by feminism. Um, yes, and also um, if I can add, 
when you said uh, one of the questions said how what approach we, we should follow i i instantly remembered one of uh, paula's quotes in 2012 in her blog she, i will quote here and maybe this can help for, uh, for the discussion she says as feminists we are part of a progressive sub subversive movement which organically implies always remaining vigilant of conservative forces and i think this is so relevant even today, because we see, like you said, that uh, donors' agendas always, I mean, not always, often co-opt the movements. So um, I think this transnational feminist solidarity showed us, for example, the Doria Fund and other feminist funds, how they propose actually solutions as well on how we can change within or outside the systems. And um, can I say something, uh, Paula? You know, just before our conversation started, we had just, at the Asfari Institute, we had just finished a discussion with our colleagues from Femina uh, with two, um, two feminist activists from Afghanistan um, who were talking about their own experiences. Of course, they're both outside uh, Afghanistan, but one of them, um, I mean, they were both amazing, but one of them was talking that one of the main issues right now after, you know, the recent devastating, you know, uh, uh, events was the fact, you know, the takeover of the narrative on, on Afghanistan, the fact that uh, especially the mainstream media isn't interested in looking at the, rea the, at, at, at the realities in Afghanistan and looking at the lived realities of women. Uh, and the main narrative is, you know, let's give these people a chance. Let's see what happens. We're in negotiations with them, et cetera. And as a result, you know, the silencing, the total invisibilization of, of, of women is actually a killer. It's, uh, it's actually criminal. It does lead to the loss of lives of women and the increase of violence against women. So I guess this is where you know political uh, 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 political blogging blogging again you know the voice the voices of women themselves their own lived experiences in their own words takes incredible importance here because it is a matter of life or death. And I think we have another question, Paula. We do. I'm also mindful of the time. Yeah, the, the last question is particularly interesting. I, you know, it would be nice to uh, to address it, especially from the from your all your point of view as bloggers. What if there is no engagement on the work of my feminist blog? Should I change the strategy, collaborate with a different entity, or stop blogging and approach feminist issues in a different way? And just to to remind the panelists, there was um a question around how we can reach more people as feminist bloggers. Yes. Um, and especially those who are not sensitive to this topic or do not identify as women. Um, and the another one on women who attack women. Um, I'll address maybe the last question quickly. Um, uh, I think a, a good strategy uh, um, could be to reach out to other feminists um, uh, in, the, in the spirit of solidarity. Uh, I'm sure you would find um, a lot of support. Uh, don't stop blogging. Um, and if you want to approach, approach feminist issues uh, in different ways, that's, uh, of course, uh, great. But uh, uh, yeah, don't give up. Yeah. Christina, do you want to address any of the other questions? Yes, I would also add, uh, reach out to other feminists and definitely don't stop blogging. Um, and also reach out to local NGOs as well, because um, NGOs, they contribute not only in activism and advocacy, they also contribute to knowledge. And um, I'm having in mind as well here in Cyprus specific NGOs that provide the 99% of humanitarian support, but they often don't have the time to reach out 
in terms of communications and uh, lobbying and advocacy. And that's how that's how, that's very important that also civil so that society organizations mobilize together, but also with other individuals and activists that can actually push forward in their own writing or in their own um, you know coalition building uh, and 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 the, it's very important because of the of the hostile environment in which civil society organizations and also researchers studying civil society sector are marginalized often from academia but also from um, other platforms so um, coalition building it's definitely one of the lessons that I have kept from, from studying uh, blogging in its diversity and dynamic process of actually blogging. This can take place in cross posting and, and publishing articles in international media, in, in, in international advocacy platforms, um, blogging platforms as well, but also reaching out to other activists and, and activist groups because often, the founders landscape as well um, make us like, like I don't remember it's Paula or Farah that mentioned it that we are restricted in project based activities and actions yes. that often keep us away from our grassroots and community led um, research or activism or other kind of social interventions. Um, Paula, can we, um, um, can we, would you like to wrap up and then I'll just close with a couple of words. So first of all, thank you so much Farah and, and Christina for your interventions, for your drive, um, for, for your, your, your engagement. I'm seeing that we still have like more comments and and I think that this is a never ending conversation. I think that the the word that I would like us to end with really is solidarity. Actually, it was probably death to capitalism, but I think that solidarity is a most more positive message to end with. Um, I think solidarity between each other and solidarity between movements um, is is of of, a, of core importance uh, in everything that we have discussed this evening. And um, I think this event is an exercise in solidarity, an example of what feminist solidarity can achieve. So thanks very much to the participants who attended today. And thank you, Farah and Christina, for your passion and brilliance. Thank you so much. I just thank want you. to point out to uh, uh, a comment that uh, my colleague at the Asfari Institute has included about the, the influence of women bloggers. And, um, you know, she's pointing out to, uh, um, to how a woman blogger asked her followers to send their stories on how they struggle with sexual harassment and violence and how this actually, you know, um, um, engaged women and empowered women to, to talk about this. So yes, absolutely, uh, Fatima. You know, every time we have a feminist conversation, you think, you know, we've hardly started and it's scratching the surface. And maybe we should spend our lives just, you know, continue, you know, just going more in depth into these conversations. And it's always like this. So this means a few things for us uh, in conclusion. One, that this is not, this is, um, this is a start of a conversation on feminist blogging. And I think you've opened up so many doors in your interventions. Like, you know, how do we nurture young feminist bloggers? How do we help from wherever we are in increasing the outreach? How do we encourage? How do we inspire? How do we support? Um, and how do we make sure that, and I'm still inspired by what I heard from our uh, Afghan sisters, how do we make sure that we are part of changing the narrative, that we are part of ampli amplifying these voices? Which takes me to my last point, you know, and this is um, for the three of you, but also for the, uh, for, for the people who are attending, um, the, you know, please consider that the, um, um, all the platforms, all the tools of the Asfari Institute are available for feminist bloggers in for any kind of format of knowledge that you want to produce. And we would encourage you, uh, please just send 
what you want out there, uh, whether you want it on the website, whether we want you want us to repost it for you, whatever you want, that, that where we can help to increase the outreach, but also to contribute to spreading the feminist message that you want to spread or the feminist testimonial, or actually, you know, that emphasis on the importance of the lived experiences rather than the interpretation of somebody else's lived experience. Um, so thank you very much. This is Christina. I'm delighted that this is the this heralds the beginning of our collaboration with MIGS, with the Mediterranean Institute for Gender Studies. This is the first time that I say that I say, say it correctly. Uh, Paula and uh, and Farah. Um, this is an ongoing collaboration and, you know, you haven't seen the last of us, you haven't seen the last of me, um, and um, uh, I'll see you again. For those of you who are interested, uh, Paula will be in person in Beirut in a week, uh, where she will be in person uh, moderating an amazing, um, uh, an amazing panel that we have on the disproportionate gendered impact of the, the um, uh, uh, conflict, the revolution in Syria, and looking at the work of feminist activists there. Uh, Paula, we're all very much looking forward. I tried to convince uh, Christina to come uh, unsuccessfully, but Farah will be with us. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to. Thank you ever so much. This was incredibly inspiring. Um, Christina, the offer is open to publish your thesis. Um, thank you so much. Have a nice evening. It's already past 9.30 Beirut time, Beirut time and Cyprus time. Thank you, folks. That was amazing. Thank you. And it's just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Elina. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Farah, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You too.